Hello everyone, it is time for our weekly live stream and today is a big deal for me only and anyone that shares this day with me, it is my birthday. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm 39 again and uh, this has been a, a running uh, thing for me for many years. So if you're wondering how old I am, I'm still 39. It's just the easiest answer. There's no reason to start being older. <laughs> I think 39 is a great stopping point. So uh, yeah, and so Caitlin was kind enough to get me some cake and tonight we're gonna have a nice dinner and uh, we're gonna do a little toast here in a few minutes I guess but uh, yeah so today's topic is naughty we're gonna talk about <laughs> someone just said spicy topic yeah we're gonna be talking about sex on the reef and I thought that you guys would really enjoy that because you know I mean, everything needs to come from somewhere <laughs> so um, first of all I want to tell you guys that uh, I shared a little video earlier this week, which may or you may or may not have noticed. Uh, the right after doing the big water change on the reef, the baby brittle starfish started to spawn and cloud the tank up after I just put in all that nice clean water. And when they did that, I thought, "You jerks!" <laughs> I mean, okay, but couldn't you have done it before the water change? You know, that would have been nice. So I want to talk about spawning in the reef tank because a lot of times people get really excited when they see new life emerging. And yet they don't know what they can do with it, if they can make it do better, you know, if they can keep it, if they can raise it. And there's a lot to, uh, to cover here, and I'm not going to cover it all, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that have happened in my own tanks over the years, because when I start really thinking about it, I've seen a lot of different things spawn. <laughs> and, you know, I never really gave it too much thought. It just is something part of the reef. It happens. Usually it happens after sunset, so, uh, which... I'm talking about the literal sunset as well as your times, your light schedule, because the livestock does learn the schedule. Just like your fish know exactly what time of day you tend to feed if you're one of those people that feeds by the clock. And if you go to a public aquarium and you visit their aquariums, you will see all the fish gathering to one area for no random reason. <laughs> you're just like, what is happening? And then you're like, oh, it must be feeding time. And then within mere minutes of that, you see someone make an announcement or you or you see a little sign come up or whatever and then they're dropping food and the fish go crazy. So the same thing with our tanks, everything knows what time it is. And if they don't right now, they will later. And corals also keep track of time as well as when there is the desire to spawn. And when we're talking about spawning, we're talking about literally releasing eggs and sperm into the reef tank where it goes everywhere and can really muck up the water. Now on this YouTube channel, there are a few videos that I've shared um, over the years, they're sporadic, but I've shared different things that have happened in my tanks that you could watch and you could check out. Matter of fact, after this video is complete, this stream, I'll put a bunch of links in the video's description so you could check out Tubastria spawning, you could check out Rose Bubble Tip eggs, uh, you could see uh, baby peppermint shrimp releasing into the water column. There's a lot of things that happen in our tanks, and I guess the biggest take home for you as a viewer is going to be how big is my tank and how much can it handle? when this occurs because if you have a very small tank and something semi-large releases a lot of goo into the water will it actually cause so much problems in the tank that things are dying or can the, the filtration handle it or do you need to interact with it so that's kind of where I need you to start thinking in advance before these things happen and then the other thing I have to tell you to do which I, I mentioned from time to time I haven't said it in a while is please look at your tank after lights out. <laughs> a lot of things happen during the evening and then into the night. And if you just like think I fed the fish and I'm turning off the light and you walk away, you're missing out on some really cool stuff. If you own a blue flashlight, you can use that. Um, there's one from Orfec that I've been using for many years. This is a very nice one, it has a nice blue light to it. It's, you can adjust the focus on it. And uh, it's really, you can make corals really glow after lights out with a spotlight of this really intense azure LED. Uh, if you're trying to spot things in the reef after lights out that you don't want to disturb, you want to get a red LED because the red spectrum is apparently semi-invisible to these guys. I've actually shined red flashlights directly at fish and inverts to see if they do anything and they seem to not see it. You'd think they'd see something is happening, maybe not well, but there's a spotlight on their eyeball, but I haven't noticed it. Maybe you have. But using the red light and the blue lights late at night is a great opportunity to discover nice things. 
so like I said in this uh, video I shared a few days ago or a couple days ago um, the uh, reef had a 160 gallon water change and then I refilled the tank and the corals were exposed to air for maybe 10 minutes I actually pumped the water out and then I used the, the plumbing I have set up to move the water right back into the system without lifting a bucket <laughs> And so it's relatively quick versus trying to pour in a bucket at a time or pour it from a jug into a sump or from a jug into the top of your tank, which could be difficult to do. So uh, in my scenario, I can drain water out rapidly, refill it pretty rapidly, and the corals are exposed to air just briefly. And really, I don't even like to do that. For the longest time, I like to just drain the water out of the sump, which would be the, the uh, skimmer zone and the return zone. I don't touch the refugium usually unless I'm trying to siphon out the substrate and then replace that water and turn the return turn pump back on. But that's a smaller water change on a big tank. And uh, you know I could change 50, 60 gallons that way, but I wanted to do a bigger water change because I'm trying to knock down the nitrates, which by the way, uh, two weeks, well, for the, <laughs> so the last year, give or take, I mean, there's been ups and downs, but uh, the tank has been around 80 consistently, which is really ridiculously high. And I'm still confused why I'm having that problem because I just don't, understand it. But um, I've had lots of people make suggestions. I've tried many different products. Nothing really brings it down. And I know a good old-fashioned water change will. And last year I did a couple of really, actually I did three big water changes in a week's time. I moved something like, mm, I did a blog about it, but I think I moved something like 550, 600 gallons through this tank. Maybe my brain is saying 800, but that's too much. But at least 550 gallons went through the tank in a week's time, and the nitrates came all the way down to about 40 or 35. I was like, all right, but then they crept up again. So I'd, I've done a total of three water changes since the first of the year, and right now nitrates are at 50. And I'm collecting water right now to make another 250 gallons of water. Now, the bigger the water change, the more nitrate you'll remove from the system. And then, of course, cleaning the system, which would be dealing with the sand bed, uh, it would be finding detritus in the sump, getting that out, removing dirty filter socks, you know, anything along those lines where things are trapped, checking in the overflow box, is there a bunch of sediment in the bottom that can be removed? That all will help reduce the nitrate on the tank. And I, here I am trying to reduce nitrate, and then all the brittle starfish say, nope, we're going to spawn into the water and keep the nitrates nice and high the way we like them. And uh, so, yeah, that's why I was like, I wish they'd done it before the water changed, but whatever, it happened, and my tank was very cloudy. Now, if your tank turned cloudy after a spawning event, the number one thing you're going to be worried about is the oxygen level in the tank. Now, because I just did a big water change, I couldn't actually look at the ORP probe and see what the number was because by changing the water, it threw the number way off anyway. If my ORP had been on a graph around, you know, let's just say 375, for example, and then just suddenly plummeted because of a spawning event to like 120 or 200, that's a warning. The oxygen level has dropped in the tank and... You, so the best solution is put an air stone in the tank to reoxygenate the water and keep things okay. And of course, you might want to do things like run a filter sock and remove it and put another one in and remove it. Make sure your skimmer is overflowing rapidly to remove as much of the gunk from the water as possible because it could be so much that it actually affects the reef um, negatively. But for me, usually when a spawning event happens, my brain just goes to free food for the reef and I don't think about it twice. But I have a much bigger tank than many of you, and so I probably can get away with more things than you could with a much smaller all-in-one system with a what I call limited filtration. Okay, I'm not putting you down, I'm just saying it kind of is what it is, you know? But if you uh, have peppermint shrimp released into the tank and you see all these babies just blowing through the water, unfortunately, you won't see them the next day. You won't be able to catch a few and just magically raise them. Growing peppermint baby, uh, peppermint fry into peppermint shrimp is an actual thing. It takes a lot of effort. I believe there's phytoplankton involved, a separate tank with no kind of moving parts. Like the only thing you'd have is an aerostone for a little bit of circulation. And you're trying to really feed these little guys until they can grow to the biggest point of now they are an actual shrimp with the right color where they could go into a reef tank. Um, so I've never successfully raised any peppermint fry uh, or peppermint baby peppermint shrimp. Um, the coolest thing out of all the spawning I saw was when my anemones were spawning. And that was, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe longer. I had a 280-gallon tank behind me, not the 400. 
and by the front door I had an angle tank that you would see when you first walked in the door and there was a rose and enemy in there. So the anemones in this tank behind me started filling the tank with sperm. And I was like, wow, my tank is cloudy. And so, of course, my natural reaction was go check on the angle tank because they were plumbed together into a common sump. And I wanted to see how the smaller body of water was doing. And it was this giant weird brown thing, just like weird. It, it didn't look like a poop, but it definitely looked weird. And I was like, what is, what, what is that? And I flip on the light. And there's this huge, like, DNA chain, so to speak, but you know, like an inch, an inch thick, maybe, maybe a little bit less. And it was kind of spiraling. And I was like, oh my God, let me grab my camera. I don't even know what this is. Let me take a picture. And what it was, was it was a giant egg packet coming out of the rose bubble tip, which told me that that rose anemone was a female where the cloudiness, the sperm from all the other bubble tips was male. And so in theory, all that sperm and egg in the water should get me free bubble tip anemones one day. So anyway, I took some pictures. I didn't do video back then. And uh, I, as I'm taking the pictures, of course, this thing kind of drifted up and then it hit the vortex and, and the eggs went everywhere. <laughs> and the, the anemone was done. I was like, all right, I did my thing. So I had all these eggs everywhere. I had the sperm everywhere. I made sure the protein serum was working okay. I watched the fish to see if they were gasping, if they were acting erratically and everything was completely normal in the tank. So I didn't do anything other than think that was really cool. And of course, I posted about it online, and people said, "Oh, you're gonna have anemones everywhere. You gotta check your sump. You gotta check your refugium." And I was thinking, not likely. And no, I never came across some really cool little baby anemone, which would have been neat to do. But uh, I'm basically a hobbyist that enjoys his tank, and I'm not looking to grow things out. So I don't have anything prepared for such scenarios to where you could quickly grab this brand new life and put it in a separate system and have rotifers and phytoplankton and baby brine shrimp ready to rock and roll and and just you know to try and do this thing i just don't do that i i like to grow corals into colonies as you know i like to feed my fish and keep it fat and sassy and uh that's pretty much it when it comes to uh reef keeping for me the one time i was feeding my sun corals late at night so i always did that after lights out and there was this one, and that was, I had this 400 gallon, and I used to have a frag tank right in that spot right there behind the wall. So right there on top of my electrical power station that everyone thought I was insane for, I had this small little 10 gallon tank that had my sun corals and uh, a lot of bubble algae and all the uh, different uh, new egg cans I bought and stuff, I could actually hand feed with some mini mices. So I would thaw a little bit of food, I would close the valve so that no more water entered that 10 gallon tank, and I would feed all those little hungry mouths, and then after 10, 15 minutes, I'd open the valve again. And I did this for the longest time. In the end, I uh, ended up taking that tank down. It was running for many years, but I was like, I was making a change. We were replacing this tank at the time, and I thought, I want to go ahead and get that. <laughs> I want to get that frag tank over there built separately and not be a small one anymore. I thought, okay, maybe I can actually grow some frags. But anyway, the point of the story is, I walked in there, I turned on the light, I had the valve closed, I think, and there were eggs blowing all over the place, tons and tons of eggs. I'm like, where are these eggs coming from? And it was the black sun coral had released eggs. And so there's a little short video of that here on the YouTube channel as well. So I would encourage you to check that out when you can. All right, hang on just one second. All right, I'm back. We are planning birthday stuff over here, so I had to take a quick little look at something. All right, so, uh, all right, what else has spawned? Uh, something that many of you have probably observed in your own tanks is clownfish spawning, and then you have all these little orange eggs on the rockwork. The, the eggs turn orange initially. That is a spawning event. The female plants the eggs, the male comes and fertilizes it and takes care of them while the female keeps everything away. And that is a completely normal thing. It's a great thing to see in your tank. It's exciting and fun. But catching those eggs and then raising them into little baby clownfish may not be something you want to do. But if you think that they're just going to move up in the water column and then swim around and turn into a clownfish one day, it's never, never going to happen. 
because they are way too tender. As a matter of fact, knowing what's involved in raising clownfish, I'm amazed there's any in the ocean. <laughs> because you know they're doing the same thing in the ocean. They release, they go toward the light, and there's all these fish just waiting to snarf them down and you know, devour them. But yet somehow, we still have clownfish in the ocean. And I, I guess it's just a numbers game. You know, they release thousands and, you know, tens survive. <laughs> That's my guess. I don't know. But one of my friends, uh, his name is Chad Vossen, he many years ago came up with something called the, I think he called it the Vossen Larval Catcher. And it was this little acrylic box that he would make by hand. And you would hang it inside the tank and it had little itty bitty light in there. And you'd make the whole room pitch dark the night you knew the eggs were going to release. And the clownfish would go toward that light. And what they would do is they basically swim into a trap and be stuck in there and then the next morning you could remove the trap with all the eggs and put them in a, in a system to where you will raise these eggs from you know from I'm not these eggs uh these larvae into baby fish and it's it's a whole thing I mean there are fish breeders out there and uh they love doing this stuff I have no desire to do it I keep thinking it would be cool one day just to try it for once but I'm like, no, that sounds like so much work, I don't want to do it. Plus, there's like a million clownfish out there anyway, because of all the guys making designer clownfish. That it's just like, eh, I just, I just don't feel the, the urge to try and add another hundred clownfish to the planet myself. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll be bored. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, it's, uh, hasn't happened yet. Okay. Um... Another thing that I saw in my tank, and I didn't know what it was, was this weird raft of eggs. They were almost white, and they were it was chunky and kind of flopping off of a, a... It was mounted to the edge of a rock. And this weird thing kind of... How do I explain it? It wasn't like a leaf, because it was kind of more three-dimensional. It was almost like a blob of peanut butter sticking up off the rock. But it was white, opaque, and it was a lot of little round circles. So you knew it was eggs. And I thought, what are these? And I'm looking at my reef. I'm thinking, what on earth would make these eggs? Because I've never seen this before. And we believe they were chromus eggs. So that was kind of a cool thing. Because at one point I had uh, the blue-green chromus in my reef tank. And apparently some of them got busy. Um, you may look in your tanks and sometimes see little egg casings on the glass. That's, uh, it's still a form of spawning in the fact that they're planting eggs to grow more snails. You may get serrets. You may get nerites. Um, you won't suddenly get astrias or trochas. That would be too nice and easy. <laughs> but uh, some of the more smaller snails are pretty prolific, and you may end up with them. Oh, speaking of snails, I'm going off topic for a second. So, you know, my reef tank is now over seven years old, and I don't add things very often. And a couple days ago, I was down at the end of the tank over here, and I was looking... And there was one of my super Tonga Nasseria snails. I haven't seen one of those in at least two years. And that thing had come out. It was on the surface. And it was. And I was pointing it out to Caitlin and saying, look! And she's like, okay. And I'm like, no, seriously. <laughs> I haven't seen this thing once in a couple of years. And so as we watched, we watched it go right back into the sand bed and completely hide. So uh, Nasseria snails are great to turn your sand over. And I've never seen Nasseria snail eggs. But... Uh, the, uh, the fact is, is that these guys are really beneficial to keeping your sand clean. They emerge when you put food in the tank and they go back under. Uh, one person just asked, where's the lady? <laughs> Caitlin is getting ready because she wants to do a toast, but we, we, she can't be on long. Matter of fact, I can't be on long because we have a lot to get done today. We've got someone coming over again tomorrow and we have to prep the house for it. So that's, uh, I'm telling her, don't be stressed. And she's like, yeah, right. <laughs> so we're doing our best here. Um, rock anemones can spawn and they will typically release eggs or sperm uh, one, at one of the events I went to a vendor had taken a rock anemone and it was in a bag and I think he was going to unpack it to put it in the tank to sell and while it was in the bag it just started spawning and it released all this stuff into the water and I grabbed my camera and took pictures of these little eggs coming out it was really really neat um, and spawning sometimes will occur due to stress you know, the, the animal is freaked out, it's going to die, and it has to do whatever it can to keep its species alive, and it will spawn. Others spawn because they're happy, <laughs> and they just want to, and that's okay too. Uh, so every time you see something new in your tank or you see new life happening, don't always think you're doing something wrong because it may be you're doing everything right. 
and typically a healthy reef tank should have all kinds of procreation happening in there where you do see things growing in abundance. It's not just about making coral longer, keep the fish alive, but actually seeing new uh, livestock emerge from the parents. You know, I mean, so it's it's a really cool thing. But like I said, a lot of times it just ends up being food if it, uh, and that's it. And the problem is, and the water's perfect, the 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 tank is healthy, but the pumps will just chop it up or beat them to death, or the skimmer will pull it out, or the filter sock will trap it. So that's why it's so unlikely to necessarily raise something that you see release into the water column. Uh, snails are big spawners in our tanks. A lot of times people see that and they'll post pictures or a little video online and say, what is happening? <laughs> What's this smoke coming out of my snail? And everyone's like, Barry White music. You know, and they, they laugh and joke about it. But s snails will definitely spawn in your system. Bristle worms will spawn in your system. And that's a weird one because you'll see the bristle worms all come up the rock works and then they like lift their head. And <laughs> the stuff comes into the water column and of course your flow just moves it across. Um, I told you about the baby brittle starfish. Sometimes you'll see eggs coming from uh, SPS corals if you're lucky. That one's probably the most challenging one to uh, make happen. That means you have a very stable system. And secondarily, you're, um, you're there to see it happen because a lot of this happens after lights out. So I wanted to mention to you guys, this is the latest issue of Coral Magazine. I have these in stock in the shop. And uh, if you want to buy a copy to learn more about spawning nights and reef tanks, there's several excellent articles in here. I've already gone through it cover to cover. I think you'll enjoy it. This one article made me laugh. So it says, the coral whisperer, and you can see this coral spawning. And then it has this one line that says, mm. spawning is one thing, but then there's the morning after. And so you can learn about what they're doing with these eggs and how they're trying to get them to grow on plugs, and uh, you know, it's an excellent issue, so check it out. I was expecting in this issue to have the list of all the latest, ah, oh, someone said fix my candle. Thank you, catching up. How dare you fall. <laughs> I was only nine there for a minute. Um, I was expecting to see the list of all the fish that are being bred in tanks, but uh, that wasn't in this issue for some reason, so I guess maybe it'll be the next one. Because usually it's the first issue of the year when they would show the massive list of all the corals. Or maybe it's just available on reef2rainforest.com, which is uh, their umbrella. So you could check that out and see if, um, if you can see the list. It's like over 220 species of fish are being raised by people, so we're not taking from the oceans. So that's exciting. Um, I did get a gift today from Caitlin. More urchins, so that'll be nice. Uh, we're planning to put these guys. We found these at Target, by the way. And uh, they're kind of a brassy look. They're really pretty. And they have a hole on the back to mount on a nail. And the plan is to probably put them up there on that upper gray wall right there. So that'll look nice. And I've got some over here that I've shown you guys on Instagram that are around Spock. So we're putting more urchins on the walls because, you know, the more urchins you have, the better. Um, urchins spawn in tanks as well. And I, th I know there's something else that popped in my head and immediately left me, but... Um, and people are say, why didn't you mention such and such? <laughs> but there's just so many things in your tank that actually can release into the water column. And you'll get the opportunity to see uh, this new life. And like I said, I just find it interesting. And I don't worry about it. But if you are worried, it might be good to be prepared to do a water change. You might be good to be prepared to make sure your protein skimmer is working at peak efficiency. Maybe clean the cup really quickly so that night it can remove all this stuff from the water column so that your livestock is safe and healthy. All right, that uh, is pretty much it, unless something else pops into my skull. Let me do some question and answers with you. Uh, Caitlin is gonna join us here in a few minutes, I hope, and uh, we're gonna crack into this for my birthday. That was a gift from my friend Ed, and uh, he also gave me these. Look at that. So this will be the first time these glasses are used as well. Gotta love a good good birthday gift. So um, let me scroll up. Remember, if you're asking any questions, please do at me live reef so I can see your question in the chat. And uh, we'll just go look for the first one now. And thank you all for the happy birthday messages. I see a ton of them. Oh, I got this shirt today too. 
Yeah. Got Baby Yoda and everything on here. <laughs> okay, Mike, Mike Fleischman says, I still need your help. I'm running fresh tumbling GFO in a active reactor using an old calcium reactor and dripping the effluent phosphate levels are not going down. How is that possible? Well, you've got the media in your reactor. What is the phosphate level of your tank, number one, and what is the phosphate level of the water coming out of the reactor? If it's coming out at zero, eventually it will be your tank uh, phosphate level will come down. If um, it's coming out at the same as what's going in, nothing's happening at all. And uh, that's pretty much it. So you need to measure the effluent of that calcium reactor, which is your GFO reactor. You don't want to tumble it too hard. It's supposed to look like a moon quake, just barely moving on the surface. It should not be tumbling like you might imagine, like bio pellets, for example. So I would look at that, and uh, depending on whatever your phosphate level is, worst case scenario, use phosphate RX to bring it down, and then use the GFO to keep it down. But uh, I myself have only used phosphate RX for <laughs> more than a decade. I'm so glad I get to say a decade. Uh, I've been using it for a decade, and it is the only thing I use, and I use, I don't know, I use more now than in the past because the tanks are bigger and there's more and more livestock, but they come in these little bottles that I probably use five bottles a year, maybe, and you know I'm squeezing in drops, like eye drops. So it's just so easy for me. I love it. I don't have to think about anything. I just test the water. I'm like, oh, phosphates are up. Let me drip some in, and then I'm done. So that's me. Uh, by the way, someone posted on the video about the micro starfish that were spawning that they consider them a pest and they're busy removing them from their tank. I would love, I, I didn't reply to that person yet, I will. I would love to know what it was actually doing as a pest because these little guys are, as far as I'm concerned, commensal. They just live in the reef and they help clean things up. They don't do any damage. So I would not, uh, I would not be actively trying to remove them. Matter of fact, my tank has thousands and thousands and thousands. As I w went around looking through the cloudy soup that was my reef, I saw so many of them. I was like, okay, well, there's a whole bunch there. But then as I kept going, like, oh, they're over here. Oh, they're over here. Oh, they're over here. They're down in the refugium. They're, they're on the side of the skimmer. They're everywhere in my system. And they're even in the uh, anemone cube, and they were spawning in there as well. So it's all one closed system, and they just go where they want to be. Um, Lynn says, I have a pair of clownfish. Every time she lays the eggs, he eats them. Do I need to get the new male, or will they eventually figure it out? I have, I have had them now for five years. Normally, they don't eat them. They may eat the first couple of times, but that's not normal. Now, keep in mind, when they lay eggs, it's usually, I think, 10, 11 days that you see the eggs wherever they are, either on the side of the rock, up on the glass, uh, or inside you know, some kind of terracotta, if you put that in the tank for the fish to use as a suitable place for their clutch of eggs. But like I said, the female will lay it, the male will fertilize, and then he just constantly is fanning them and keeping them, uh, getting lots of movement across them. They should wiggle. And they'll be bright orange initially, and then they turn silvery, and that silver look is the eyes that you're seeing. And then near the 10th or 11th day, all you see is like giant eyeballs, and usually that night is the night that they all release. And that's why they usually kill all the lights in the tank, so that the fish are not attracted in any specific direction, and if they're trying to capture them, they'll hold a flashlight directly at the center of the tank, or they'll use some kind of LED or whatever to use a very fine sieve, or a, a sieve's a good word, to capture these and move them into another tank. So I know that when people are trying to feed them, you know, after they've taken them out of the reef, They'll put them in a small box that's blacked out on all sides, and they put a light in the dead center because they don't want the clownfish to bash their brains out trying to hit the walls of the aquarium. So they want them to be attracted toward the middle where it's completely safe and they can't hit anything. Um, I feel like there's other precautions, but I, I read that stuff so long ago I've forgotten it. But I feel like a heater was okay. Um, I'm pretty sure no power heads were allowed. There's probably an airstone system maybe some kind of a sponge filtration in there to capture or whatever. And of course, you know, the, the person that's doing this will be cleaning the water regularly to make sure it doesn't get polluted. And I'll tell you, once you, 
get these clownfish into little tiny fish. They swim in a ball. They're gorgeous. And you'll see this ball of clownfish in one spot, and they just, like, swim over in this group. And then when they're bigger and healthier and ready to go, they start spreading out a little bit. But that initial ball is so cool looking. And if I can ever find the video I shot when Tammy was here, when she brought me the clownfish with an enemy cube, I'll release it because she was very gently hand, uh, pouring them into the tank from a like a Rubbermaid or a Tupperware container. She would lower in the tank and they'd swim out. And she'd tell them, come on, get out. And they'd swim into the water and then they turned into a ball. And it was so neat. Uh, Adam says, I thought you were running an algae scrubber. I am. I have a refugium too. I have all kinds of stuff going on. Um, Mahmoud, uh, thank you very much. He says, I, I really enjoy the helpful videos. I usually listen during my long drives. It's the first time catching a live stream with my seven month old on my lap. <laughs> Gotta teach him young. Uh, someone posted the other day, maybe it was on the stream, but they were going to watch the stream, but I guess got distracted. And when they came back to the room, they saw their one-year-old just watching me, <laughs> watching the stream. I thought that was so cool. I think that was last week's stream. And yes, got to start them young for sure. Uh, the spiritual counselor says, have you uh, considered exfiltration methods aside from water changes? Well, I've tried a few different things. One of the things that I definitely want to still do is uh, siphon more of the sand bed. So with that new batch of salt water that I just made or that I'm making now, uh, that'll allow me to lift all the corals off the sand, kind of clean up down there, and then really sand or gravel back that sand bed that's over seven years old. And I mean, I don't know that that's the, the source of the problem. I, I'm not even sure. <laughs> but whatever it is, it's just been high for a very long time. And I've tried so many different products for a long, you know, for the last few years, and nothing's really making this massive change. So I know water changes well. I just saw the comments says Mark is nine. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Nazari says I'm transferring tanks and placed the majority of my biomedia into the new 20 gallon water box. How soon can I transfer my corals? I would say once if the water box is all set up and everything's running right and the numbers match the other exist, the existing system, you should be able to move everything over and just do a tank transfer. Uh, Anu Rood says, I need your suggestions. I placed my two MP40s on my three by two by two reef. Should I place them on the back or at the sides? Uh, really, it's a, a matter of preference. I have seen tanks where the vortex are in the back blowing forward and hitting the front glass, and that makes the water churn and go back. Uh, that can work, and that can look really good and kind of make them invisible, especially if your background is black. So you have a black Vortec powerhead. You know, they're, they're very dark colored. They're black, yeah. And you, I remember when they were brown. <laughs> My brain was like, what? But uh, you could put them on that black background. They're almost invisible while they're clean. And as they get dirty, you have to take them out and clean them and make them nice again. So that's one method. You can have them on the ends of the tank. You can have one up high and one down low. And that's another approach. It really comes down to the preference of what, how you want the water to move through the tank, how to avoid making the sand move, making sure that nothing's obstructing the movement of water. But uh, you may end up needing another MP40. So, uh, but for now, I think starting with two is a good idea. Hmm. Wong says, 39 forever. Yep. Uh, Jennifer says, thank you for sharing your wisdom. I'm in the DFW area. How is the club currently? Well, the club is kind of in, in a standby mode because of what's going on with COVID. But we just sent out an email to all the members of the club. So if you are a member of DFW Mass, you would have gotten this email. We've got six speakers lined up for the first you know, six months. Uh, next Wednesday is going to be our first presentation of the year. Dwayne Ostrike from, uh, from uh, Seattle, Washington, my friend, uh, that's a great coral keeper. He's going to do a presentation about maintenance. That will be a Zoom presentation. And then uh, hopefully we can capture it and upload it to the DFW Mass YouTube channel. So I've been telling our club members, please subscribe to that channel so when we upload something, you'll, you'll get a notification. And the plan is to have a speaker every month for the next 12 months for the year. 
and then hopefully 2022 we can start meeting in person again. But yeah, I miss all the things we used to do like club bus tours, frag swaps, uh, you know, one day events, you know, where like our famous next wave event, you know, but all the stuff's been on hold. So we're going to focus on taking care of things the, uh, the virtual way and keep people safe while we're still waiting for everyone to get uh, protected. Luca says, what do you think of the orange spotted filefish? I think they're beautiful, and uh, I've never kept one. Uh, and that's all I got. <laughs> I actually have a coffee mug that has one on the front, and I, I drink from that from time to time. But that's as much as I got for you there. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Dennis. That is what I was going to talk about. So uh, he said a few years ago, we had a hell of a lot of little Bengay cardinal fish. I'll post some photos to the club. Uh, he's talking about Club Meals Reef. And they spawn like crazy, and we managed to raise them all. So if you have a pajama cardinal fish, or if you have Bengay cardinal fish, those are mouth brooders. They actually do their thing. The male carries the eggs in its mouth for weeks, and then finally releases them. And sometimes those little guys will survive your filtration and you'll find a few you know, that went down the drain and are living and are adorable in your refugium. Or they'll be somewhere near the intake of a powerhead or all places, just kind of chilling. If they had a choice, they'd be hanging out inside an urchin or some other place. Sometimes people find them in the back of the rock work. You know, little tiny itty bitty fish like, oh my god, that's amazing. But uh, unlike freshwater, where you'll see, and I, I know nothing about freshwater. So all I can tell you is I saw a picture of this really big fish with like a thousand little fish next to it. And I thought, that looks so neat. And that's as far as I got. But um, it's it's uh, not something you see in saltwater tanks. You don't see the parent fish with a billion babies next to it. That doesn't happen in our saltwater systems. Uh, Reefer Madness says, how has the NO3 brick worked? Or, or dosed it, uh, it made an impact. I tried the uh, export NO3 brick on my own system and I didn't have any luck. It just didn't make any change at all. So I, uh, and I tried for nine months and I followed their guidelines specifically. I even spoke with the owner of the company. And I showed him pictures and video of where it was set up. You know, I showed him everything. And he said, I don't understand it. Neither do I, but uh, I gave it a shot. Mike, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Reefer Madness asked, how is the club tree in the ocean doing? You're talking about the Coral Restoration Foundation project we were involved with. They actually renamed it to Bonaire... Bonaire Restoration? Something like that. Uh, so we have two adopted thickets in their, um, in their, their purview that they have been taking care of and tending to. And uh, Club Miller's Reef, which is the group on Facebook, a lot of members contributed. We raised over $2,000 to adopt those two thickets. So as far as I know, they're doing well. When I get to go diving again, I'm going to go back to Bonaire and visit it again. That would be really nice to do. Um, I actually have this sort of handy. So let me open it up. I'll stick this on the screen for a minute. If you're watching the video, you'll see this. So uh, the red are all the names of the people that contributed money to the... Uh, trying to read what that thing says. <laughs> um, trying to remember the name of this thing. But uh, they contributed toward this coral planting effort. And then there's this pole that is standing up on the shore where the divers are. and Anyone that's bought one of these thickets gets one of these little signs affixed to it. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, contributors. Their names are on this pole of fame, so to speak. So we have that up there on the wall as well, which represents us that we did something nice for them. So I, uh, we were going to put it on the club, but then there was a lot of people that didn't contribute, and we didn't want to make people feel bad or something. I mean, it's something. It was spur of the moment. We just had this idea, and we put the uh, opportunity up said, look, let's raise a thousand dollars. I'm leaving in eight days for this trip. It would be great to, you know, adopt this thicket. 
and instead we ended up raising two thousand dollars in a week it was it was nice you know and then i was there and i got to uh tour their facilities and see all the different um different corals being planted here and there and hanging off of these trees in the ocean because that was the thing you could adopt a tree which is this pvc contraption that floats with a big float at the top and an anchor at the bottom and all the corals are dangling or you can get giant thicket and it's not like, like we're buying the thicket so we got that if i ever have time to edit more videos i want to get the bonnier video done for you guys uh, Paul says, what is your thoughts on one big water change or automatic water changes multiple times per month? Happy birthday. According to Randy Holmes Farley, who did a really good article on this years ago, you can take, you can do a big water change or you can do a lot of little ones. And apparently mathematically, based on his science, he says it's all the same. So you don't have to sit there and, uh, and think, because people are like, well, if I change 50% all at once, I know 50% of that old nasty water is gone. But if I change 1% daily, there's 99% dirty all the time. And then when you do the next water change, you're losing a little bit of the 1%. And I was just like, oh, this math is too hard for my head. So I just wanted to see what Randy said. Randy did his whole research, wrote the article about it. And, he, and the, when I went to In Conclusion, which is my favorite part of his articles, he just said, it's all the same. <laughs> it still does a good thing. So if the benefit of automatic water changes is you don't need to worry about the temperature of the water because you're changing so little at a time. So if you have a jug of water near the reef and it's three or five degrees colder or 10 degrees colder, you know, like let's say it's in the garage and you ran a tube all the way to your aquarium, for example, changing one gallon on a hundred gallon tank won't notice it. So no problem there. But if you were to pour that water in all of a sudden, even a gallon, there'd be this chill that hits at least something, some fish, maybe a coral, and they get hit with this icy water before it has a chance to equalize the rest of the reef. So the automated part of trickling it in quietly and stealthily is appealing to many people. Uh, the only thing I always warn anyone that's doing automatic water changes is to please physically do a salinity check every single week, no matter what, like clockwork. You know, I tell you water test Saturday, even with an automatic water change system, you should still test your water, and that includes measuring salinity because during your water change that's going at, at three in the morning while you're asleep, perhaps something isn't set up correctly or something has got messed up that you had set up correctly and it pumps out the water and your top off turns on water and puts in more fresh water, which is now lowering salinity every single time this happens. Your protein skimmer could be overflowing a few times or frequently and all that water that was dumped out would again make the top off come on, which changes salinity. So it's really important to know your salinity of the tank. And I know there are probes that just tell you and they track it all the time. Still get out your refractometer and verify. Okay, that's all I'm gonna tell you. If you can do that, then yeah, automatic changes might be your thing. Myself, I do the manual thing and I know giant water changes will lower these nitrates and I know little tiny ones over a period of time will probably do it, but it'll be more gradual. Uh, GJR, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Maker of Things says, can, is, can anything cause alkalinity to rise without dosing? Uh, my new tank with old tank rocks, the alkalinity has gone up 1 ppm in the last 10 days, and I haven't dosed anything to the tank. And my coral is upset. Um... Alkalinity doesn't really just come from nothing. It either comes from the rock, it comes from the substrate, or it comes from an additive of some kind. So if you're dosing nothing, and you said 1 ppm. I'm sure you mean like 1 dkh. So we want to just find out what you could be adding to the tank that's doing it. Is there anything in your top off water? Uh, is there any kind of a, I don't know, some strange... Oh, what if you put in like those bio bricks or those bio balls that people like to put in the sump for extra filtration? Uh, those kind of things could also leach out some um, alkalinity into the system. And are you ready? I drink. <laughs> they all want to say hi to you. All right. So come on over here. Look. Caitlin, 
They were like, where is she? Ugh, hiding. In my hidey hole. So this stuff's strong, so I only give you a little bit. <laughs> Just drink it off camera so I don't make a face. Well, you can take a sip and see what you think. Anyway, happy uh, birthday to me. <laughs> I like this because it warms you up from the inside. <laughs> it's true. The three fell over. Oh, no. And I said, are you nine today? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, we have got a lot to get done here, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. Let's, let me have ten more minutes, and then we'll start doing all the other things. Does that sound good? Yes. All right. You don't have anything you want to say today? You had, I felt like you had a topic. I have a billion topics. <laughs> all right. Um, you want to save it for next weekend? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you look beautiful. Let me uh, do a few more questions, and then we're going to, we did our toast, you know, I've, I've done my topic, answer some questions. We have to wrap up early today. It just is reality. Um, Reefaholic, I answered this one last week, but I'm not going to tell you to go find it in a two-hour stream. If you're treating a tank being fumigated for termites, you're going to basically have to tarp off your reef tank, turn off the protein skimmer, and get a large air pump that you put outside where the air is clean. You know, there's no chance of this chemical getting, you know, into it because you're going to pump that fresh air into your reef tank into a weighted air stone or two. And you're going to be pumping in this fresh air into the tank constantly during the entire fumigation process. And that is a, it's called negative pressure. No, positive pressure. And you're pushing the air in and it's forcing anything out of the tarped aquarium. You're tarping it, basically you're, um, you're sealing it in. I wouldn't go tape it down so tight that it can't possibly breathe, but you're trying to keep everything out. So by covering it over and you know taping some corners and kind of keep it snug and then pumping the fresh air into the aquarium itself, anything that's evil that's trying to come in through uh, fumigation will be pushed out by the air coming out because you're constantly pushing air into the aquarium. Does that make sense? Just have to think about it for a second and you'll say, oh, I got it. But that's a really important thing to do in those scenarios when you're forced to uh, treat a, uh, a home for a, a really bad pest. Yeah. Uh, Alan says, is it possible that a flame angel could eat hammers and torches? Yes, flame angels are known to nip on corals. They can pick on SPS corals, they can pick on LPS corals, they can pick on scolies, uh, meaty corals. They're, they can even nip at clam mantles. So it's one of those, it's a 50-50 chance that your uh, flame angel will be okay. And, you know, so, I mean, that's a great uh, ratio. 50%, it's definitely going to work out. 50%, it's not going to work out. I still would take the chance and hope for the best. And maybe you'll get lucky and it does work out. Maria says, I just noticed I have an Aptasia, which I didn't know was Aptasia. <laughs> so, uh, and now there's eight more growing. Couldn't believe how fast they grew, so I just ordered some Aptasia X to hopefully help. That definitely will work, and if that doesn't work, I have F Aptasia, which stands for exactly what you think, and you can use that to definitely get rid of them. Rasmus says, compliments on the beautiful girlfriend. You deserve it. Thanks for all the knowledge, Obi Wan Kenobi, best from Italy. Aw, how are things going in Italy? Man, you guys had such a bad hit when the COVID thing was going last year. I was so worried about everyone in Italy. Uh, G Bear just asked, uh, "How did the reef do after the water change?" Just saw the bristles making a mess. Did just fine. Next day, water's nice and clear. Rudy says, happy birthday from China. My first time being on your live stream. The time difference makes it quite difficult to join regularly. I believe it. A uh, matter of fact, uh, I was talking with my friend and she was saying how if we're going to do these virtual speakers for DFW Mass this year for our club, then I could start using speakers from other countries because it's virtual. It's a great opportunity. And I thought, yeah, but the time zone thing could be a problem. But I'm a little bit nocturnal. So in theory, I could record a uh, interview with them 
and then I could upload to the DFW Mass channel, and that way uh, the members would get their quote-unquote meeting on the right day and time. Uh, it would just be released right at that moment, and uh, we'd get to hear from people on the other side of the planet, which would be really fun. And thank you very much for the Super Chat, Maria. Let's see. Wow. Lucas says, did you try a Zolit filter? I think you're talking about Zolite. Uh, the media, he lowered his nitrates from 25 to 5 in 7 days. No, I have not. Paul asks, what about the big news coming out of Hawaii? What is your opinion on how that will affect the hobby? Well, number one, I'm very annoyed that uh, the fisheries were closed down because they are considered the best example of sustainable fish harvesting from the ocean, bar none. No, there's no other place on earth that does it as well as the people did in Hawaii and yet due to opinions and pressure on the government and a year ago and I shared this on club, on uh, my Miller's Reef page on Facebook not Club Miller's Reef but the actual business page a year ago a government report came out that showed a graph of all the fish from you know years ago to now how there's way more population of fish than ever before despite the sustainable harvesting of fish. And they are saying, you know, and to find out that this real data was totally ignored just irritates me. Yeah, and it, Caitlin's pointing out that unfortunately these, you know, we talk about, oh, now this is closed, but people lost their jobs because of it. The place that was doing all the work, the people that worked there in Bagot, the fishermen that went in the ocean to find the fish, they all are unemployed now. So more unemployment. And all because there's a small group of people that just complain a lot. So how will it affect us? I don't know. But I do know in Club I should stick this on the screen. In our group on Facebook, one person posted a picture. He just came home from Petco, and he got himself a beautiful yellow tang. Did I say $5? $15. $15. Mm, <laughs> that thing's worth like a million dollars now. Because <laughs> you could never get one from there again. And he got one that was marked down at Petco. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty crazy. Uh, congratulations to that person. Good job. I'm glad I have a yellow tank. And it did come from Hawaii. Uh, Keith says, carbon dosing will increase the DKH, or raise alkalinity. As for Randy Holmes Farley, as nitrates get reduced, the DKH will rise. Well, I'd love to see that happen in my tank. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I like a higher DKH in my reef. I tend to keep it around 9. Pokey Fish, no, yeah, Pokey Fish Reefing says, any tips on how to get a clownfish to go into the anemone? Believe it or not, one of the craziest things people have done that has worked is to actually put a laptop in front of the aquarium of a clownfish in an anemone so that the clownfish in the tank sees it and thinks, oh, I should be doing that, and goes and does it. So you can try that. Uh, other people, before that, before you had the YouTube option, would print out a picture of a clownfish and an enemy and tape it to the glass for a, a hint. So, I mean, you could try that as well. Derek, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. He says, happy 39th birthday. Oh, no. My candles went out. Already? <laughs> I, I was going to blow them out as I was wrapping up. You're slow. I, I'm so long-winded, <laughs> I blew them out from here. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, we are wrapping up here. The last question of the day. Masood says, all of my corals are happy, but one of my goniopores is closed and dying. Alkalinity is 9, calcium is 450, magnesium is 1350. I do 10% weekly water changes. Phosphate 0.08, nitrate 1. Good job. Is there any secret about goniopora? Yes. Uh, Ganyapora are notoriously a hard coral to keep alive. There are certain foods that can work. Uh, there's Ganyo Power that was created by a friend of mine and is sold through Two Little Fishies, and I have it available on my website. And it's literally food for Ganyapora corals. The other choice would be to maybe try something like Bena Reef. I know some people like Reef Roids. But there was a guy here in, in our club back in the day. He lived in Dallas, and he had a giant, and I'm, I mean, this is not an exaggeration. It was that big. Red Ganyapora. I saw it in person. It was that big, and all we fed it was flake food. Flake food! I was like, you got to be kidding me. No one can keep this alive, and you're using flake food? So, yeah, it does happen. Uh, sometimes you can have a perfect reef, and a coral still won't make it. I would focus on all the things that are doing well, 
Of course, I would care about the one that's not doing well, see what I can do to save it, but you may not have luck. I believe the red ones are easier than the green ones, and then they have these crazy colorful ones that are being aquacultured that should do better, but I tried to frag myself a couple of years ago that I got at Aquashella, and it didn't live six months, so that just is what it is. Lamont, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. And it looks like I got to the bottom. I got all your questions. Thank you so much for all the birthday greetings. Uh, one last thing, a quick little plug, uh, if I can find it. I do appreciate when you buy things from Milo's Reef. Uh, whenever you buy things, you're going to calculate shipping during checkout. And if I'm able to ship it for less, I refund you the difference. So if you see a big number and it's freaking you out, it could be because that's FedEx, but I can use the post office and save you money. It takes a little bit longer to get there, but you'll um, you'll save five bucks, ten bucks, depends on what you're ordering. Um, I'm not here to uh, take advantage of you. I'm trying to get you the products you need that I sell. So I do appreciate your support and that you guys tune in each week. We'll have another live stream next Saturday at two o'clock Central Time, and it'll probably be a little bit longer. And hopefully, I'll have my co-host with me, and we can chat about all things Reefy. Um, I, you guys have a great weekend and. Uh, I will see you online in Club Meals Reef. Bye.